Aloha and thanks for joining us at Think Tech Hawaii. We are doing the Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. I am your co-host, solo co-host today, Justine Spiritu. Matthew Johnson is slaving away, uh, working on our Baba Empire right now. Um, sorry, he can't join us. Uh, so every other week we bring on farmers and other folks that are involved in our uh, local food community, whether they have a product or a restaurant, if they offer support services to farmers, of course the farmers themselves. We love to get the backstory of, of how people fell into the work that they're doing and kind of what they see happening in local food in our community here on Hawaii. So every week is exciting. Today we have a special guest, uh, Nat Bletter who is the co-founder and chocolate flavor meister with Madre Chocolate. And Nat, you have been here at the Think Tech studio a number of times. Uh -huh. So thank you so much for coming to hang out with me. Of course, and, it's and been talk a while, so it's good to be back. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So yeah, I'm really excited to hear, um, of course, your background. If we could hear a little bit about the, um, the studies you did and what led you to cacao and chocolate and that development and kind of the the role you've played in creating a market for this product and what you guys kind of do in the community. Sure. Yeah. Um, I sort of stumbled into chocolate uh, indirectly. I, I did my PhD in ethnobotany, which is related to chocolate, but I was studying medicinal plants in the Peruvian Amazon and Guatemala and Mali. And cacao is definitely a very medicinal plant, but I wasn't looking at, at it as a, as a medicine exactly. Um, but I, uh, a, a classmate who was a Mayan archaeologist asked me to write a, a book chapter about um, traditional uses of cacao in South America. And I tried to put it off, her off for like a year or two, and finally my my advisor was like, "I'll help you. It'll be really fun." Because we always talked about food, uh -huh. and he was he was a, a big foodie, uh, as was I, and so then decided to do it. And it was like a three year distraction from my PhD. Nice. Because <laughs> I got so into it, and um, and then when the book came out in 2006, uh, a bunch of my friends were like, "I don't want to read your thick." tome, of an academic tome about cacao, just like make us some chocolate or something. You know you like to cook and yeah. you, were, you wanted to go to culinary school. It's like, oh yeah, it might be a way to bring together my interests in, in food and ethnobotany. So I just started experimenting um, yeah, actually in San Francisco in a friend's, with a friend's coffee grinder with just some uh, cacao nibs that I got at the um, at the health food store, and it turned out great. And I was like, "Make more, please." Um, you just built up that demand among friends. Yeah, yeah. And it was it was very coarse at first, which is how um, chocolate is traditionally made, um, as a uh, just a, you know for drinking chocolate. So it's not ground into the smooth thing that we know from from European chocolate bars. But people kept asking for more and more of it, and I went back and made like about a thousand bars in my kitchen in New York. Uh, it's just with a coffee grinder and a food processor and eventually got a stone grinder to do it more smooth uh, European style and then came out here in, to Hawaii in 2008, uh, sorry, 2009, um, doing a postdoc at, at UH. And I was in the same building as the Kava Cacao and Coffee Lab, which, as you might imagine, is the most popular lab. <laughs> yeah, yeah. everyone's hanging out. Like, yep. what's everyone doing in here? Exactly. At 3 p.m. every day, they have a Kava Circle, so you get to talk to people. And I was a big Kava fan even before I moved to Hawaii. Um, so I started to meet some of the farmers, cacao farmers that were here already, and uh, I think there's only about like one or two chocolate makers at that time. I was like, I shouldn't be making chocolate in New York. That that makes no sense. You should be making it where the plant grows and okay. where you have contact with the farmers. And uh, so started doing it here and founded Madre in 2011. And we've been getting strong since then. Awesome. And so you guys described this as artisanal chocolate. Can yep. you kind of explain what's the difference between your product and, you know, like the $2 Hershey bar <laughs> in this store? Like, um, that not to discount them, they do some amazing stuff in like keeping chocolate incredibly consistent over very variable farming styles and ferment. But what we're doing is, you know, micro or even nano lots compared to, to what a company like that does. 
And the big thing that we do is work super closely with the farmers because we feel that is essential uh, to get really good flavor. And a lot of people don't know this, but uh, chocolate is a fermented food. So when you have the, this is a fresh cacao pod that I was showing earlier, when you open it up, there's this white pulp inside. And um, that tastes delicious, nothing like chocolate. It's kind of like uh, uh, mango steen or guanabana or something like that, or lychee. And uh, have you had it before? Yeah, yeah I have. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's pretty tasty, but it's related to okra, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it shows that kind of funky texture. But um, all the sugars from that um, gets, uh, it fuels the ferment, and it goes into a big wooden box and gets uh, stirred every day for about five to ten days, and that removes all the bitterness and develops all the nice acidic uh, flavor. Um, and I brought some, some beans from a local uh, windward side farm. So these are fermented, and you can see they have no fruit left, fermented and dried. Uh, this is from 21 Degrees Farm, and uh, this is, I think, only their second harvest. And um, it has this incredible uh, fruity, lively taste, if you want to give it a try. Um, it's, it's very not bitter because it's been fermented uh, well, and it um, has some umami and nice floral flavors and all of that. Um, and it's totally different from, say, these Guatemalan beans. So a lot, a lot of it is focusing on the terroir or the flavor differences that come from where the cacao was grown and fermented. So, so how many different varieties um, do you work with? Um, varieties of cacao, probably four or five. Um, mm, I like that one. Yeah, you like oh. the bottom one. Those are also roasted, so that'll add some some other differences to it. Um, in Hawaii, there, we mainly have um, uh, criollo, which are usually a smaller, um, more difficult to grow pods, but they're really valued because they have a really mellow flavor. That's uh, sorry, that's what's prevalent here in Hawaii. Uh, it's not prevalent, but a lot of farmers, especially when they're first starting out, really want to grow that because it's a higher price per pound of okay. finished cacao, but it is harder to grow and more disease prone. So mm. if you, after a while, people realize like, oh yeah, it's not financially worth growing Criollo as much with the high cost of, of labor in Hawaii because you'll, you'll get like the same revenue uh, per acre or per effort. So an uh, easier one is Trinitario, which is probably like these, these giant guys. And they're, they're a hybrid of the wild type and the criollo. Um, so they're, they're, they're pretty tasty, and they combine a lot of the, the, the sweet flavor of the criollo with, uh, um, uh, with the, the vigor of the wild forest type. So. Um, that's the main one that grows here. But then we work in other and get cacao from other places like Solomon Islands and Vanuatu and Guatemala and Dominican Republic and Brazil. And there's, I mean, altogether there's about um, 12 different varieties that have been named of cacao. And and people don't always know what we have, so we've probably worked with all of them. Just wasn't clearly. So the, the, what varieties you work with is that always changing, or do you have like? A con it's not consistent in that sense. You're always kind of experimenting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and this photo now is from the Rapun farm in, in Wayahole. It's another great local farmer. They're one of the few organic cacao farmers. And they probably mainly have the Trinitario type there, too. Um, and I tell farmers, they're like, oh, what variety should I plant? I'm like, it doesn't really matter. We can make good chocolate out of any of them. You just have to work on the ferment, and that is the most essential part, but it's also the, the ugliest and most unappetizing part. It's a bunch of rotting fruit. Yeah. <laughs> so if there's any Instagram geniuses out there, we need you to help us figure out how to make that look beautiful because we feel like three quarters of the flavor gets added during the ferment over all the other st stages like roasting and, and grinding. So. Um, yeah, so we, we play with like different inoculants in the ferment, like kombucha or sour poi, to sort of send it off in different directions. So you have a pretty active relationship with the farmers? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, both on Big Island, Maui, Kauai, 
and 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 it's very uh, strong relationship, uh, especially on Oahu, because we do fermenting for a lot of the Oahu farmers. Um, uh, partly because so many farmers in Oahu are diversified, um, mm -hmm. so they have to, you know, process their their kalo and their cacao and their vanilla and their papaya. And if it takes like you know six months to a year to learn how to process e each of those, um, they might not always have time to to figure out the cacao ferment, which is pretty complicated. Okay, so that's something you guys just take on. Yeah. And the other issue is that so many farmers here have like, you know, 10 cacao trees and you need about 500 to get enough critical mass to, to get it to really heat up well. It's kind of like a compost, you know, like if you have oh. a tiny compost. Okay, so then you kind of aggregate it. Yes, And And exactly. then so if you're aggregating from multiple farms, where does that take place? You're bringing it all to? Into our Chinatown shop. Oh, we okay. All the fermenting there and then oh. controlled conditions. And we... We, we mass them all together, but we keep them in netted bags or pots, so we can still at the end say, okay, these are yours from you know, Kahulu, and these are yours from Waiahole, and these are yours from Pupakea, so that we know when we're making the chocolate, there's only one farm's cacao, but we can still get the benefit of the, the critical mass. Yeah. Okay. What's the, uh, but you also said you work with a lot of farmers all over the world, which, yeah. which kind of keeps it interesting. So what's that ratio of, of working with the local farmers versus the, uh, the other farmers you're working with and how involved are you with those farmers in other places of the world? Yeah, it's, um, uh, there, we wish there is more cacao in Hawaii. There's always more demand than there is supply. Okay. Because it's a relatively new crop. It's only been grown in earnest here in like the last 20 years. So okay. it's increasing. I just came this weekend from the Hawaii Chocolate and Cacao Association meeting and they're saying there's like 120 some so that's producing in Hawaii now. And I was on one farm in the Dominican Republic a few years ago that was twice as large of all of Hawaii. Just the one farm? <laughs> yes. Okay. A single farm. What's, okay, then let's skip to that really fast. And what would be like the, I, the ideal? What would you like to see of how much, what's the potential that you would want to see of um, farming um, with cacao? So then you could source it locally. I, th I think we're... We're never going to be able to compete on, on quantity in Hawaii just because of the high cost of labor. So, like the best, what's considered the best cacao in the world from Venezuela or Ecuador is max like four or five dollars a pound. Hawaiian cacao is a minimum of eight dollars a pound, up to ten, even oh. if it's not good quality. Okay. So, just and it's understandable why, you know, if you have to bring in uh, inputs and energy and sometimes fertilizer mm -hmm. and, um, and labor, it's pretty labor intensive. You have to hand harvest all the pods um, and crack them open by hand and ferment is a lot of hands-on stuff. So it's n the price is never going to go down. And we're never, we don't have the land mass in Hawaii where you can grow it. You can only really grow it below about like uh, 1,500, 2,000 feet. So that's like a ring around the, the edge of all the islands. Okay, that's okay, so that potential is kind of small. Yeah, exactly. So it's going to be qu quality is the only way we compete. Okay. And that's why we focus on the ferment so much because we can say, yeah, it's worth it at $10 a pound because it's so carefully fermented and so much attention is paid to it. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, that, we're already through our first segment. We're going to take a quick break, right. and then I want to hear a little more about how you work with the farmers elsewhere, and okay. then a little more about your role in the community. Wonderful. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for Likeable Science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. Hi, I'm Cheryl Crozier-Garcia. I'm the host of Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. It's a program where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. So join us every other Tuesday from 4 o'clock to 4.30. We're live in the studio 
on working together in Think Tech Hawaii. Take care. See you soon. Bye. And Ms. Solomon Island. Welcome back. This is the Hawaii Food and Farmer series. I'm your co-host, Justine Spiritu. Matthew uh, ditched me today, but it's okay because I'm hanging out with Nat Blutter, the co-founder and chocolate flavor meister of Madre Chocolate. And now we're getting to dive into a little bit of sampling. Can I try that one that you gave me? From this one I just tasted, tastes like Christmas in my mouth. So Yeah, this is an ancient Aztec recipe, first published in the 1500s with chipotle and oh. allspice in it. So. The Mesoamericans, the Aztec, Maya, and Olmec are the ones who invented chocolate. So oh my God. they've been doing it for thousands of years and feel mm. like they should know what they're doing when they're combining the flavors. Yeah. So where, so all these other kind of flavors and stuff that you're infusing, mm -hmm. how, which of those are made up and which of those are that have like a historical part of chocolate? The Chipotle allspice uh, oh is one of our... I love it. <laughs> it's yeah. so good. Uh, a lot of people at first are like, chilies and chocolate oh. doesn't make any sense. I'm no, like, no, it's made sense for thousands of years. Right, okay, so that's not a new thing. No. That's, okay. Uh, that what was one when I originally would see that in the store. It's like, right. yeah, it doesn't make sense, but... This is our um, Mexican drinking chocolate, which is um, chocolate de mesa, which just means table chocolate, and it has cinnamon and allspice in it. Um, so that is... It's, it's post-Columbian, but this is what you commonly find in Mexico now for making drinking chocolate. Just melt it down, and that won a gold medal for one of the best drinking chocolates in the world. Um, in terms of other flavors, we do uh, some really rare Mexican spices like Rosita de Cacao, which is a flower that smells like maple syrup. Um, We've done one with Jaguar Cacao, which is, is considered the female uh, form of cacao in Mayan mythology, whereas cacao is the male. So huh. that's kind of like the original white chocolate. It has these very uh, non-bitter almond-like seeds, and it turns out as like almost white chocolate. So we swirl the two together to get this like yin and yang effect. Um, and and do lots of stuff. We love chilies, so we do yeah. a lot of stuff with that. Yeah. Uh, but then stuff like uh, lilikoi or coconut ginger, those are more like Hawaiian-inspired flavors. Okay, and that's where you kind of use your knowledge and, and make some of Yeah. What's been, what's like the most successful one that you've, that Madri Chocolate's kind of been credited with? The um, coconut ginger is our most popular. The one that's won the most awards is the triple cacao. Um, because it's the only um, chocolate bar we know of in the world that has that cacao fruit in it. So when, when we're here in Hawaii and we get to, you know, enjoy that delicious pulp, um, uh, we're like, you know, you sh everyone should enjoy this in the world. This is such yeah. a delicious fruit, not just people uh, living where cacao grows. Um, so we put that fruit in a bar with the cacao nibs, so kind of like, so it has the crunchy, the chewy, the smooth, rich chocolate. And, and that's uh, one of seven awards now. Whoa! So it's, nice. it's pretty hard to make because it's hard to get the fruit. Yeah. It's been a so then, okay, so then back to some of the other farms you're working with. Oh yeah, I wanted to give you some of the Oahu chocolate. So this is uh, grown by a great local astronomer, Megan Ansdale. And uh, so we call this the Mega Parsec Bar. Yeah. So this, uh, we did the yeah. ferment and and drying and roasting and grinding the whole nine yards on mm. this one. She, mm, she did the it's growing. It's like smoky. Yeah, yeah. a little bit. Mm. Um, so that's uh, lo all locally grown and made on Oahu. She has a farm in Kaneohe. Okay. Um, and then you're asking about other farmers we worked with. Um, for the last uh, two years, we've been going to Melanesia, to Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu. And this year, I'm going to Papua New Guinea. And we've been doing what we call our cacao boot camp there, mm. where we teach the farmers for five to eight days about about uh, fermenting and, and teaching them how to make chocolate too. Okay. Hello, huh? How you doing? It's me, Angus McTech. Wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy every Friday from 
1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Welcome back. Sorry, I had to take a quick sample break. Um, <laughs> we're back. Can you get back to the, um, the boot camp you mentioned? I yes, the cacao boot about camp. About yeah. Um, it's, uh, so for about five to eight days, we work with the farmers to, uh, teach them not only, uh, planting and pruning and, and fertilizing and grafting, uh, but then everything that comes after that, that they, they might not traditionally do. So the, the fermenting, drying, uh, roasting, grinding and tempering, um, so that we feel if the farmers can make their own chocolate and taste it on a daily basis, they're going to make amazingly better cacao. Wow, we, that's that's interesting. I mean, so you're doing this workshop for farmers? Yep. Okay. Yeah. The is what happens traditionally is farmer grows the cacao, ferments it and dries it, and then they send the beans off to the U.S. or Europe or Australia to be mm -hmm. made into chocolate, and they never taste it. And, you know, they and they never get to see the end product. So it's kind of like asking a painter to paint this beautiful painting with their eyes blindfolded and their hands tied behind their back. It's like they never know what changes they make, what effect they have. Yeah. So we really feel like the, you know, the cacao farmer, even if they don't make it on a regular basis, they should be they should be doing test batches of it at least so they can see, oh, yeah, when I gave it this other fertilizer, it was so much happier and the chocolate tasted so much better. Or yeah. when I planted this variety or fermented it this way, it was so much more awesome. And that's the nice thing about doing it in Hawaii is that we can close that design loop and within like a month or two of getting the, the cacao from the farmer, we can give them back the finished chocolate and say, yeah. What you did on last batch, that was killer. Keep doing that. Or like, hey, why don't you try boosting the temperature a little bit or adding some poi into the ferment and, and see how it tastes different. So it's really closing that design loop. Um, and we're really excited because last year we put on the first annual um, Solomon's Cacao Awards. And we had 83 entries from around Solomon Islands. You were part of the organizing? Yep. Yeah, okay. and the judge. One and the, the judge. One of the five judges, yeah. And it was a little daunting because we came into this room where they'd be receiving it at the Department of Agriculture, and there was 83 entries and about 800 pounds of cacao that we had to figure out the top three of in only five days. We're like, oh, my God, how are we going to do this? So Wait, that's you would do, determine that just from eating the... We, like, yeah, so we narrowed it down first. I just like crawled around on the floor smelling them all. I'm like, this one's smoked. <laughs> we can't include this because we're not, you know, we said it can't be smoke dried. That's one of the things they've done traditionally there. That kind of, it's okay for commodity cacao, but it's not good for, if you want to make a chocolate bar out of it. Okay. Um, and then, so we got it down to like 50. And then we did like a quick roast and, um, and just tasted the nibs from those 50. And then we got it down to, to 10. And then we made chocolate out of all 10 of those. Oh, cool. Uh, with like all night tempering session, grinding sessions um, with five other chocolate makers were there. And then we got it down to the top three. And uh, this guy, Blaze Sekavai from, from Guadalcanal, he was... Uh, he had been in our boot camp the year before, and he got third place in the awards. So we were like, oh, this is awesome. Like, in only a year, he put into place all the things he'd learned, and he yeah. was getting awards already. And now wow. I hear he's going to be on, like, TV in Solomon Islands for all of his efforts. So. That's awesome. That's so cool to, to come into this, be creating this product, but be a part of that design process right. like you talk about. Like so this is the product oh of that. This is we just got... We brought one bag on the plane back with us from Solomon Islands. We're trying to oh figure out God. how to get more. That's so good. So that's that's his bar there. Uh, Maddie, you're missing out. <laughs> <laughs> if you can call in, that's yeah. the Solomon. That's Blaze's 73% uh, Solomon bar there. Mm. Oh my God. So is okay. This is limited edition. Yes. This is awesome. Only only one sack. Only about 50 pounds that oh. we were able to bring back as luggage. So. so good. If you know, if anybody knows anyone sailing to Solomon Islands, <laughs> let us know. We've got some cargo to stash. 
Oh, awesome. So cool. And then I want to talk a little bit about, so in addition to having these products, you also guys take the, it, I mean, it's interesting that you, you take the chocolate making process to the farmers to do themselves, but also for consumers in the community. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about those classes you offer and, oh, yeah. and what that has been like for people to, to come into your shop and be a part of that? Yeah, the, I mean, I guess you can't get the teacher out of me since I was, uh, I was teaching at UH and, and while I was in grad school. So even from like the first year I was making chocolate in New York, I was trying to teach other people how to do it. Yeah, that's cool. Because I feel like everyone should know how to make chocolate. It should be, you know, open sourced and, and, and people understand like why does this bar cost ten dollars? Yeah, yeah, totally. And a lot of people come to our classes like, oh, I'm gonna make my own chocolate. And then after they take the class, they're like, oh, I'm gonna let you keep making the chocolate. <laughs> yeah, I understand yeah. now. Yeah, that, which is funny. <laughs> That's like the similar thing we see with like farming. You right. know, you know, people want just like cheap food. We want everything, the vegetables to be cheap. And then they come right. to the farm, and then they understand like, oh, this takes a lot of work. This exactly. takes a lot of heart and energy, and and they kind of they can appreciate why. The value of that. All the effort that goes in, yeah. Good. And you guys do some other cool workshops too. What's this? What's the whiskey? The whiskey one. Oh, that's a really fun that. one. Yeah, <laughs> it took a while to get going, but um, we had a, a guy on our staff who was Scottish, and he's like, oh, "We got to do this." And so he helped me pick out a really good set of whiskeys, both from uh, America and Ireland and and Scotland. Um, and uh, and I think it actually goes better to me uh, with chocolate than wine does because the wine has its own tannins and astringency that can kind of compete with the chocolate, uh -huh. whereas whiskey complements it more. Mm. I mean, it might not be for everybody, especially like the super peaty scotches, but we try to represent the whole range of flavors that you find in whiskey from bourbons to rice to, to highland and lowland scotches. Um, and the flavor range of chocolates too, so you can kind of oh. mix and match them. Awesome. That's really well, fun. We have 40 seconds left. Mm -hmm. I know we want to talk really fast about some new developments. You wanted to mention Jamal oh, and yes. what he's doing, and then, yeah. yeah, if you want to do that we're, quickly. Before we're really we excited. <laughs> uh, Jamal Lahiani is a, a former chef um, from 39 Hotel in Bevy, where some of you may know him from. And he's just joined us as head chocolatier, and he's going to be running our cafe and probably eventually restaurant program. So we're going to integrate uh, chocolate into savory food and bring in some of the moles that you find in Mexico. So it'll be pretty exciting. Yum, that sounds awesome. And where can we find you really fast, your website, and more info about that? MadreChocolate.com, and we have a shop both in Chinatown on Pawahi Street and um, in Kailua on Kainahe Street.